Hey guys, Brennan with Whiskey River Trading, and I am here with Craig Roost yes. of Council Tool, uh, who's my father. And this is a very rare occurrence that we sit in the same building. Uh, he made the journey up uh, to Iron River to check out how the new place is and lend a hand for the last few days. Um, and we live 14 hours away. Right. Which So that's why it's, this is a rare occurrence. Before it was eight, ish hours away and now it's uh, even longer since we moved all the way to Iron River so thanks for coming sure worth the trip definitely yeah. we spent the day um, or the afternoon here uh, working on the shop at the project. house yeah project at the house just a little bit of projects while I have an extra set of hands and some knowledge on framing so yeah. That's talking how, business while we're working. Yeah, talking while we're working. So that's always fun. And now uh, it's after dinner and we're sitting down at the shop, at the, not at the shop, at the warehouse building um, in downtown Iron River. And this is where we do our fulfillment and shipping and all that. So I'm, I'm, I've got him here and I'm kind of showing him how we've got our new flows happening, sure. that whole process. So. Got it. My way of keeping tabs of our one of our one of our dealers. Yeah, exactly. Understanding how your how your business works and how we can help support that. Yeah, and so he is the uh, your supply chain manager yeah. with Council Tool and a designer. So he works directly with Council Tool as an employee, and uh, I am obviously a dealer. Where Whiskey River is a dealer, uh, and he's the connection. I grew up around uh, him designing stuff and making stuff to make his job easier at his day job when he was a uh, carpenter. So when he started designing for council, I was like, well, what better opportunity for us to start selling his art form, his, the stuff he's designing. I kind of touched base on that with Todd of Delta Diners interview, because he had asked how I got tied in with axes sure. and tools and council tools and stuff. Sure. So, yeah. Sure. It's one of those things where you Every stage in life, every step we take um, is a step forward and how somehow yeah. we, as a, as both adults now, we kind of brought our, our two yeah. businesses together and I think it's working out pretty good. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I am, I have been, I think both of us have been involved in m multiple different industries and mm -hmm. different jobs um, from truck driving to welding to maintenance to carpentry printing. to printing yeah printing um and so it's been like when you are involved in that many different industries it makes it you know uh, a lot easier to fit into the next because they also share similarities and um i'm bringing experience and knowledge from the previous and yeah. use that to help support and make the uh your current position more rewarding and for sure Productive. Yeah, exactly. So the opportunity to fix up this building and has been easier since I have been around carpentry. And then, you know, I talked to two truck drivers on the phone today about freight deliveries, and it's super easy to talk to them if you've been in their shoes. So, yeah, it's uh, been great to uh, um, combine our knowledge, I guess, in a way. Uh, and Whiskey River. Uh, is multifaceted in itself and one of those aspects is a lot of these tools we brought some, or we pulled some out kind of thinking we would like to share some details and some design aspects of them and just kind of talk about that but I wanted to start with the shovel handle that I'm starting to become kind of obsessed with in Iron River area this has became a very popular tool for me to be finding at garage sales and antiques antique stores it is, I think, remnants of when people used to heat off of coal. Here. Okay, show that. You can kind of see it. It's a square D, wooden handle, all wooden. You can see there's rivets pinning the handle together, just, you know, because it is, it would want to crack over age. And then it is uh, steam bent, and this would be where the bottom of the shovel handle is or sorry, the bottom of the shovel is. So this is actually, you're driving your force down into that shovel. Uh, pretty common with standard everyday replacement handles uh, for shovels. You know, they're all kind of shaped like this, but not uh, 
being a one piece all out of one piece of wood. So uh, we think this one's ash. At first I thought it was oak, but now that we're looking at it, it definitely looks like ash. But yeah, so we were talking on the way here about this handle and a lot of folks think that, and we find this with axes, that the improvements or the changes that have happened over set the century of industrial revolution has been because it's to improve the tool when in the process and but in all reality it's not necessarily always to improve the tool like right. the reason why handles are made in a certain way now is not necessarily because those handles are the best handle they're from work from, from, a, from, a, from, a, from a user standpoint mm -hmm. but they're it's a process in manufacturing which gets lost a lot right because a lot of people are like well everything's always improving well it is improving from a manufacturer's standpoint. Right, yeah, right. Whoever's standpoint yeah, is... Yeah, who, which angle are we looking at? Right. And in the case of, you know, you go to the hardware store or you go to a... Um, uh, big basically, box. Yeah, big box store, you're you're finding handles that are only an inch thick, and that's because they're turning it out of... Uh, flat stock. Flat stock that's one inch thick, and that doesn't give you a lot of wood, but it's easier on your legs and all of that, so... I got asked on Instagram what the advantage of this style handle is. And the advantage of it is they don't make this anymore. You can't get this. This is complicated to make uh, in the sense that manufacturing has, like, and tooling has advanced. So now this has became obsolete. obsolete. It's like, why would you make an all wooden handle when you could do you know, your steel press bent with the wooden top or plastic even on top. Mm -hmm. um, so I like to talk about that with ax handles a lot. And this is kind of a new venture for us. Um, I, who knows how long this is gonna take for us to get into production, but um, on the mission to serve historically correct handles, sure. uh, this is this is the one. A lot of people who've do, done reenactments or do reenactments and chuck wagon competitions have been showing interest in this and train train guys for sure. shovel and coal. So, right. so yeah, um, I feel like the the idea that of manufacturing and uh, the user kind of floating back and forth. I feel like one thing that Council Tool has been doing in the last decade or half a decade has been trying to focus more on what the user is. Right. is doing with it versus the cheapest way to make it or the fastest way to make it or the you know sure. that I mean, process and i'll kind of coin on that is um there's so much uh so many foreign products that are brought into the united states um there are very few tool makers tool companies in the united states right like all the big boys have left they're either in mexico or india or china or any they sort of that and so there's not much left in the United States. And so, you know, just just being American made does have, you know, a value, mm -hmm. but it, it's only so far as the pocketbook can get opened. Right. You know, you, you can't you can't just say American American made and expect everyone just to start throwing money at you. Right. Um, and so what we've been trying to do is if we can't compete on the lowest price and we can't compete on you know, the, uh, you know, the really mass, mass production right. that we're going to, we're, we're trying to really focus on, on quality of product from a, um, functionality and user standpoint. So a lot of our, you know, designs recently, um, we don't really cook out too many new designs, but every time our die blocks get worn, we have an opportunity to then reset those dies or resync those dies in the machining process and then make some changes to those products to improve existing ones. Yeah. So we're not just like status quo, this is how we've been doing it and we're just gonna leave it. Yeah. We get an opportunity, let's try and improve because then we want to basically compete for those dollars that are focused on the guys that know what that tool is, how it's used, and can appreciate the fact that it's it's a more productive 
tool, it makes yeah. them more productive yeah, or needed. safer. Yeah, needed. Yeah, in some right. some way, whether it's yeah, their crew is safer using it, or their um, it's it's easier on their body, or it is. Right. You know, there's I mean, so many different ways. I mean, I want to if we yeah jump this, right into it. This yeah. would this would be one of them. This is this is our uh, five pound um, fallers version. Uh, we also make a a longer one, which is on a thirty six handle, which is the splitting version. But this, the old style five pound was actually more of a, uh, a very large felling axe profile with its cheeks and long bit, and it was very blade heavy. And it's, you know, guys were trying to use it to bang wedges and people were, were using it to split wood. Yeah. Well, as a felling axe, it really didn't do either of those really well. And so by, Changing the profile to be more wedge shaped so that it splits better. You're gonna see it like yeah, this better. Yeah, white. So it's got a more of a wedge shape for splitting, and then with the larger pole in the back, now it's balanced so that it doesn't rotate in your hand. So if you need to swing around the corner to drive a wedge, you can do that one-handed. There's no blade drop. Yeah. And then that just that balance in itself makes it a little more stable when you're swinging it uh, when you want to split with it. So. Basically, we we changed the design to be more efficient for how people were using our old five pound. Right. So instead of us trying to teach somebody how to use the old one, we just changed the design so that it's more uh, ergonomic and usable yeah. for the people who are using it. Yeah, for sure. And, and it's been a really good seller because of it. It has, yeah. And uh, pretty much everybody that's gotten one of these has been super happy with it uh, when they're whether it's loggers, guys who are doing timber falling, or uh, backyard folks splitting firewood. Homesteaders. Uh, homesteaders, yeah. This is just like a great all around tool that folks can really um, get some use out of. It's like, the, I always say the flying fox, like anybody uh, can find value in it, have sure. owning a flying fox. It's it's a hammer, it's a, it's a, multi, -tool. It's a multi tool, yeah. And you can, it's small enough you can fit in your. In your car or in your truck and you know it's like a it's just great to have in your toolbox and the five pound splitter fallers act is a um it is like the next step in that that i think is anybody can use it even if you're just having campfires in your backyard in suburban america right. like then you you know a tree service drops off wood to you to split up every year that's this is like this is the tool you want is a splitter um so you're not going to take it camping but right i mean unless you're camping out of a truck right i guess, I guess right. if you're at a campground and um or yeah. you got a dedicated campground where you go every year yeah, and at camp at camp yeah yep. at camp yeah this yep. is a great camp tool keep it right in, in the dedicated camper trailer up at camp <laughs> yeah exactly yeah hang it on the wall when you're not using it and uh and don't let anybody use it that you don't want to have them ruin it. And right. Yeah. So well, with that flying yeah, box. Here's the flying box. This is a straight handled flying box. Uh, something that we, I, I'm not sure when this video is being published, if we're going to have them in stock, but it is something that uh, sells out pretty quick. We do have them in stock right now when we're at this moment. Um, this is new ish in the last, right. since November mm, or probably. about tail end of last year. So we're coming up on a year on this, uh, and they go in and out of inventory when we have them at Whiskey River, but uh, 21 inch straight hung. It's, yep. I guess, technically marketed it as a 22, but... Because right. that's the size of the handle that we start with. Exactly. Um, just so that in the future, if we decided to put it, put this handle in a taller eye, yeah. that we'd have the material to do it. So exactly. that's the thing about... Um, if we are going to be designing products, um, we don't want them to be one trick ponies. Um, that's why the, the flying fox is more than a camp axe. It's one that also qualifies for competitive throwing. Right. Um, same thing with the camp carver. It's camp half an egg carver. It's a camp axe and you can use it for entry level carving. Splitter fellers. Right. Five pound, yeah. Exactly. So we're, we're trying to do So with this handle, we actually designed this handle off an old vintage riggers style handle. So it's got a little bit of a sweep to it, but for the most part, it's straight. Um, the advantage of this over the 16 inch handle is that now you're basically getting an additional hand grip length. So now you can get two hands on it for yeah. 
more control. Uh, you don't get tired as easy, even though this is a lighter head. Uh, but there's a lot of people that aren't comfortable swinging um, a large hatchet one-handed. So this longer handle allows you to, to do that. And then on the reverse side is that it's nice that no matter where you grip this, the cross section is basically the same for most of the handle. Yeah. So you can choke up for it if you wanna use like a hammer in close stuff, or if you got a big target, you can, you can really get a good swing on this thing, or even get two hands on yeah. it in both directions. So yeah, yeah it's, that's why we designed it. We're actually making this handle in-house now um, in our sister um, company called the Waccamaw Woodworks. Yeah. So it's on the same handles. campus. We've got some lathes that we're using to turn blanks to make handles now. So we don't do all of our handles, but just a slight right. few patterns. Yeah, and the cool thing on, that, on this handle is the Flying Fox gets the standard handle and the premium handle goes into the Camp Carver. Right. Um, and so Dalton, can't, Dalton our, one of our last YouTube videos, Dalton cut down a tree with the Camp Carver and then it got hung up and we had that whole uh, thing, that whole video, the oops video, and so you can get two hands on it, you can cut a tree down. It wasn't a massive tree, it's like 10, 11 inches, something like that. Right. But um, they, both of these axes with these handles, um, it's just like a great hybrid between a boy's axe and a hatchet, really. Right. And you can do the work of a boy's axe because it's on a longer handle, but you can choke up on it and use it as a hatchet. Right. So, so yeah, that's, uh, that's the camp carver here. Uh, one of my favorite products that Council Tool offers. Uh, I camped for uh, over 180 nights in 2019 with that axe. I almost said 2018. 2018. No, maybe it was 2018. Now I'm forgetting. Now I'm forgetting what co with COVID, but I did a pack axe and then a flying fox, and the, or a pack axe of camp cover and flying fox. I think that's the order. But a great all around tool. Like you, I don't, I didn't need any other axes. This is, I can count 10 stakes. I can chop stuff up and I will, I will put the preface on the fact that I am a, I camp, I sleep in a van. I don't, I'm not like, I'm You're not, not, building like, a I'm shelter. not like walking in a hundred miles with this thing and doing it. So the long handle was, or well, that was the 16 inch version. Um, right. but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's not necessarily a backpacking hatchet. You're not gonna be, you know, doing lightweight backpacking with this thing, but it's a great camping ax and uh, you can put it in a, a UTV or a truck or uh, you can put it in a backpack if you wanted it. It's just for a day trip. So yep. it's a great multi-purpose tool. I've skinned a deer with it yep. at your place. Yep. Um, flayed it. Flayed it, yeah. Not like, fillet, flayed, flayed. Flayed, like, right, opened it up, broke right. it in half. To uh, to stretch the, the, the hide and to get behind yeah. it to beat the hide That's off. That's right. That's called flame. With the pole. Yeah, with the pole. Yeah, it was a winter deer. I hit with the van and then we processed it with that. This thing's super sharp and because it has the advantage, uh, the design advantage to being able to choke up super tight on that head. Um, and yeah, and you can use it as kind of like an ulu to slice with. So yeah, all around tool. I, I wish that we could be publishing videos of us processing deer, but Social media doesn't really like us, yeah. blood and gore and guts and all that. So uh, we try really hard to make sure that we don't get flagged for having weapons, which is our latest uh, adventure on Google ads and on uh, Instagram and Facebook ads has been us being flagged for weapons um, on these tools. So uh, maybe we'll do a private video somewhere on our site or something of a, of a the demonetized private video of, uh, <laughs> of us processing a deer. I do think I still have that video. It's it's not necessarily po professionally shot by any means or in the back and right. deer, deer hanging from a tree, but yeah, maybe we can share that sometime. So yeah, um, great multi-purpose tools. Both of those are, both of those are home runs, I guess, with Council Tool. I've been super happy that they've brought those to the market and they, uh, a couple yeah. of our top sellers. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, those are those are very popular, and everybody that's gotten them has been very happy with those two those two models. So, the one you've got in your hand there is is the latest. I think we did we talk about that in the last video we shot. I can't remember. Uh, I Actually, think we may have mentioned it. I can't remember if we got those when we were here. It may not or be available before. at the time. Yeah, but boys axe two and a half pound, or sorry, two and a quarter pound head. Uh, standard line on a 19 inch handle which makes which what? makes it a house axe house axe 
historically yep. correct to what a house axe would be. Right. Um, it goes up from here. You could have a house axe on. Uh, you could have a four pound, five pound right. house axe or head on a short handle. Right. But I don't know if you wanted to talk about the like what a house axe is in a historical sense. Sure. I mean, a lot of people have their own uh, uh, opinion, and obviously, um, culturally across, you know, in North America, I think is where I collect most of my um, information. Yeah. So I'm not going to speak on the European side, but the house axe is mostly an American, an American idea, and it's the one that uh, stayed on the porch and stayed in the house to process stove wood for for cooking and for heating the home. Um, so you'd have a a cook stove in the kitchen or in the summer kitchen and uh, it have a little small firebox you know basically it sounds about the size of a loaf of bread is on some of these and yeah. it was just for cooking it wasn't really meant to try and heat the whole house even though it would add heat to the to the main structure yeah um, so you're not you're not putting a log in that you're, right you're like corn cob size right it's it's just chunks. small stuff so uh, the house axe the idea <laughs> is that the head is heavy enough to um, do some splitting or some limbing or even cleaving of branches and the handle is just long enough to get a good swing but you can choke up on it and still feel comfortable for accurate splitting yeah um and it could be it could be anybody in the home um, i would guess that traditionally it was mostly the uh, mothers who were cooking and needed an axe or if they had one of their kids that were going to be helping for the day yeah. or if their responsibility was to process all the stove wood they need for the meals coming up. So this is something that's a little more manageable for um, people who aren't experienced yeah. or are smaller stature. And, and inside. And inside, right. You're not swinging a full-size boy's axe in the, in, inside the house. It's just right. not like practical. Right. Right. So it, it basically checks a lot of boxes for for that specific need to create firewood for the uh, cook stoves. Yeah, yeah, that's a, so we had this as a special project, we talked council tool into putting the boys axe head on a 19 inch handle. Um, I'm a big fan of their 19 inch handle, which is found also on the Hudson Bay um, and on the pack axe. Yep. And it is, that's it, that's it. that's what they're found yep. on. Uh, a handle that I'm that I've liked on both those models and uh, the eyes the eyes the same yeah they share that. the so same boys axe eye exactly on yeah. all, all three of those yep so it it just was like hey you guys make this handle and you guys make this head uh, you should put it together so we've got those in stock right now and those have been a pretty big hit for folks that are looking for something to keep next to their fireplace yep. I was pretty excited when when you brought up the idea because I mean I I think that uh, there's a lot of people that. You know, as they start to learn about axes and they start to understand or learn about the history, you know, if you can give them something that really hasn't been created in the last, you know, maybe 40, 45 years, sure. maybe more, maybe more, you know, maybe 60 years and I'm, kind of bring that back. And even though a lot of people don't have cook stoves, but it is a really good camp axe for processing firewood at camp. Yeah, I'm planning on putting one next to our... Uh... Not necessarily a cook stove, but our oh, right. that, the one we stove. just moved in. Sure. We just moved our uh, pot belly, sure. I guess in a sense, pot belly stove in, and that this is gonna be the perfect one to sit next to it to bust up to make little kindling slivers sure. to throw in. Um, I have one that I think I bought from you actually. Okay. Um, I'm actually gonna be using it as what I call a splitting buddy. So that means that if I'm splitting larger stuff with a larger axe, like elm or even yeah. some twisted uh ash a little bit the and stuff. in their strings i'll actually have this on my belt and be able to carry it with me and then pull it out and cut those strings or or cleave something really quick and then put it away as opposed to try and uh, hit that same spot with a, a larger axe and take up that more energy yeah this way this is a way for me to you know bring this with me carry it on me at all times yeah. and then also i can use it to drive small wedges for dropping smaller trees right yeah exactly yeah, I use a 24-inch boy, boy's axe for um, banging wedges because uh, I'm not, uh, I'm talking about plastic wedges right. for the record, uh, felling wedges, and uh, that's what I use. I don't fell anything super big. I'm like 24 inches. 
you were at the property today, it's like we don't have too many trees that are over 24 inches. And the right. ones that are, I don't have no interest in ever cutting down because right. they're right. Uh, beautiful, old, and uh, they're going to live for another 50, 60 years, mm -hmm. uh, probably outlive me. So there's no reason for me to cut them down. Um, so a boy's axe works perfect for especially small stuff. And this one with the small length, you could throw that in a toolbox or a box on your four-wheeler and, and ride it. Right. Yeah, like ride it out to wherever you're needing it. Or yeah, I mean you could belt loop carry that in a hammer, uh, -huh. in a hammer holder if you wanted to, right? With a mask on it. Yeah, because the uh, the hang points are very similar, very like across from each other. So as long as your belt loop is is big enough, or your hammer holster is big enough, you could easily put this on there and walk in with walk it. in with it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I like these, I like it a lot. Yeah, the medium mask fits those, and that's a. Uh, the same mask that fits the Flying Fox and the other boys' axes. And the new Hudson, and new Hudson Bay. And the new Hudson Bay, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, there, again, trying to cover multiple bases yeah, with the same exactly. product. So. Yeah, I mean, that's like manufacturing one-on-one is not just making one specific, you know, thing that only does one purpose. If you can use your tooling right. and use your... Uh, and also push stuff through your dealer network and they're already set up. Like, hey, you already carry this mask in stock. And mm -hmm. so you don't need a second mask or another SKU to, you know, right. do this. So right. um, add another product. Yeah. So today we were, well, after work was over, we had a, um, we put some T111 up uh, inside the office of the shop. Decorative exterior plywood. Yes. Where it looks like it's Exciting. boards, but it's just routed in grooves. Or however they do it, I'm not a manufacturer of that. And we, uh, I, it reminded me that we should talk about these shears because we use this, these shears to cut uh, fiberglass insulation. Bat insulation. Yeah, bat fiberglass insulation. I have uh, since we started carrying these like two and a half years ago, and since carrying these, I have I go to grab it all the time. Right. I go to grab these all the time. Right. This is not. At first, I was like, ah, oh, shears and. Um, Ben of Baryonyx manufactures these. And so they're American made out of Maine. Well, I don't know if they're made in Maine, but they're distributed out of Maine. He's, he took design elements of old vintage shears and combined everything into, into what these are, the Humboldt shears. These, uh, kind of go in line with what we're talking about today, where it's like scissors got cheap. <laughs> They right. got plastic handles. They became more scissors than actual shears, right. things that are like a utility tool right. because manufacturing and demand. Right. I mean, like people are, people are more cutting paper and things like that, but. Well, the demand just recently in the last probably 25 years has been, uh, you know, the boomers get older, they get into quilting, yeah. they get into sewing. Fabric. And so the fabric industry has been big. And so if you want to get a really nice scissors, you get a, get a fabric scissors. Yeah. Well, the problem is, is that too many guys are stealing, stealing their wives their and their girlfriends yeah, scissors. scissors and are getting in trouble. Yeah. So I, I have a feeling that, uh, you know, I own one yeah. and I'm, this is an unpaid you know, <laughs> a plug. A, a plug for this. But uh, um, my wife now borrows this when she yeah. needs to cut some heavy duty stuff. And I encourage everyone who works here in the warehouse to use these because they're safe. These are a lot safer than a, a razor blade or a pocket knife, you know, like, yeah, we can all carry around these, these fancy, you know, uh, bench made, you know, mm -hmm. and bench maids and all these crazy, uh, fancy knives that everybody is super into. But this tool right here, uh, it has a chisel point on it. I don't know if you're gonna be able to see this in the, you kind of see the chisel point there. But anyway, this works like this. You don't have to open it. You just grab it. You take that point, score tape. you just score the tape, cut the box open. You don't even have to open these things up, you know? And then also we cut banding on pallets with this steel banding, it'll slice steel banding, chicken wire. Um, it'll cut your finger off if you want, you know, if that's what you're into. But the cool thing with these is that they unbolt and then you can clean them, sharpen them, maintain sharpen them. them. Yeah. And, uh, we've got a few customers who swear upon having these in their kitchen for oh, processing right. meat mm -hmm. and vegetables and uh, things like that. So they're heavy. You can quarter a chicken pretty quick. Yeah, definitely. Um, so 
yeah, shears changed over the years. And now we're trying to work on bringing back uh, a shears that is like, I wouldn't say unbreakable, but it's time very tested. sturdy, time tested. Uh, it feels like the shears that you saw sitting on your teacher's desk when you were a child. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, so lucky enough to find your grandpa's toolbox somewhere. Exactly. From the forties. Yeah. So I keep one of these in the van in the toolbox. We've got a drawer system in the back and there, I always have one of these. We've got, I've got one on my desk. We got one on the shipping counter. There's one always floating around the warehouse somewhere stashed. Uh, and then we've got one in the house. So yeah, these are like everywhere because I find use with them all the time. Definitely. Uh, I feel like I'm salesman right. in but like <laughs> definitely if you haven't tried these yet, pick them up. If you don't like them for some reason or they don't fit your hands because they are a little bit big. I don't have super big hands, but like uh, I know that the the high schoolers that help us, um, they struggle with them sometimes, but uh, you can give them away if they don't fit your hands. And whoever you give these to, it's gonna be super into it. So, yeah, um, we got a bevel gauge here. This is the, the last of the products that we've got sitting here. The bevel gauge bottle opener we just dropped on the site. I sent you one. Sure. We put, I like it. We put a 60 degree bevel in there as a joke. Right. And to get people on the internet to ask why we have a 60 degree bevel, because that's a useless bevel. Well, then um, if you trace it three times, then you have a straight line. There you, you go. Up to 180. Yeah, we're one and a half and you got a 90 degree, you know, <laughs> so if you're trying to find 90. But, um, but yeah, I feel like this is going to be an ever evolving project. Show it, show it down. Yeah. You can see the each bevel different and then a bottle opener on the top. These are stainless steel, uh, I can't remember the thickness. I think it's 006, but um, yeah, 22 bucks on the site. I think this is gonna be an ever evolving product that we add stuff to or maybe pull some stuff away from. Um, we'll see. Different version, yeah, different, different generation. Version. Exactly. If you rust, you rust. Yeah, yeah, this is V1 right? of, <laughs> of bevel gauges. Right. And bevels are important. Do you want to talk about bevels? Why, you know, why would someone be choosing a 25 degree grind against a, you know, 32 and a half degree or even a 30 degree? You know, what is the advantage on a, on an ax? Or knife. Or some knife, those, yeah, I guess you could, smaller bevels. Yeah, 15 degree on a knife, right? I could see that. Like a scanning grind? Yeah. So, yeah, what's the advantage of a, a tighter, a tighter bevel? Or a wider bevel bevel on a on axe. What what makes you choose? I that? would say uh, penetration, and uh, and but that's only to a certain extent, depending on the the use, the size, the weight of the axe. Um, and there's a lot of uh, carvers that like to drop below twenty five degrees, but they're not swinging it for the fences. Yeah. They're using it almost like a chisel or a knife on a stick at that point. Chipping away. Right. Um, but even the more obtuse um, bevels are to at least give yourself an edge, um, but one that's sturdy enough so that when you put the shock of a, of a five pound splitter into that system, that you don't snap the toe off or, or you know. Roll it. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it helps protect the that wider angle helps protect the, the leading edge. Yeah, way. more so material there. For me, it's, it's uh, and for a lot of guys, it's uh, it's kind of like buying property. It's location, location, location. Yeah. But for tools, it's application. You know, figure out what you need to ask this tool to do and then dial it in to give it, it, it the best chance of performing. Yeah. And if that means resetting the bevel to a different pitch, you know, this, that gauge then allows you to know, okay, what's my starting point? Yeah, it's a yeah. reference point. Yeah, right. Yeah, and am I am I grinding it narrower? Or am I grinding it? Right. Yeah, what am I? There's doing? very few people can eyeball it. Yeah, for sure. And the people who can, or say they can, um, I've found at trade shows when you pull out a bevel gauge, they squirm and you know are like, oh, I don't, I don't actually know what. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's right around twenty two and a half. You know, mm -hmm. but it's like, you know, they there's no way of measuring it. You, you can eyeball it, but. Unless you're grinding thousands and thousands of axes right. a year, you're not you're not gonna be able to get it as accurate. It's okay, as, it's okay to cheat. Yeah, it's okay to have a gauge. Right. I mean, in all manufacturing, 
there's gauges. And I have a I have a I have a gauge for checking the thickness of steel when I weld, because I don't care how much you weld, you can look at a piece and be like, that's eighth inch, and then you uh, look at it a month later and you're like, I don't know if that's actually eighth inch, you know. So I have a gauge. Touch it, touch it to it. It takes a matter of a couple seconds. It hangs on the welder, and I can figure out kind of how thick that stuff is. So sure. Yeah. Um, I like I like gauges um, to learn from like new old stock original axes that you find. Uh -huh. You know, say it's a you know a Michigan single bit axe that has never been touched. Okay, well. Those guys, 80 years ago, when they made it, what's the bevel that they put on it? What yeah, did they that was start like a, with? That was a pretty standard axe. Right, so like, and so just it? to learn, you know, okay, what are the, how are these guys, what are they setting that bevel in as a starting point? Just, and that's just good information to, to gather and then translate that into modern manufacturing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's, that's worth mentioning. Because I mean, that's where most of my, most of my axe knowledge is a combination of collecting old heads and examining them and and testing them and you know just kind of figuring out how they're shaped and you know what the cheeks look like and what they use for and then and then with all the information that's free online yeah i mean there's a lot of there's a lot of information out there there's a lot of guys willing to share their experience and knowledge and all you got to do is just be willing to plug into it yeah yeah and ask the questions if right. you have a question or search for the questions on the forums or on Facebook groups, you know, you've got um, search functions. So if you're ever like at, wondering like, what should I be setting my bevel to for white pine? It's like, and it, then you get specific down into, is it dry and dead or is it right. alive? Is it frozen? Right. Is it, you know, right. there's, it's the, the you knowledge. Get very granular and, pretty quick. Yeah, exactly. Um, you can nerd out. We call, I call them ax nerds. You know, the guys who are like, you know, my ax showed up and it doesn't have, it's a, it's, it's a half of a degree off right. for the bevel. It's like those those guys are on the internet and they are more than willing to share their experience on how wet green ash splits. Mm -hmm. I've never split wet green ash because all of ours are dead here. Right. I've only right. ever split just wet dead ash. <laughs> wet dead ash, which oftentimes <laughs> is either a sponge or it is uh, or it is rock hard. Mm -hmm. So that's a uh, yeah. So that's something that I use as a resource a lot. And, mm -hmm. um, it's and a matter of fact that so much of that information has been lost to time mm -hmm. because in the last, you know, 50, 70 years, um, with the advent of, you know, LP, uh, liquid propane, natural gas, electricity to heat homes, yeah. but there's not a lot of people that, that heat with wood and that, yeah. And, and the lumber industry is different with chainsaws and, and uh, felling uh, machinery, right. you know, all that kind of stuff. So there's very few people that actually have the everyday knowledge that people did 70 or 80 or 100 years ago who use an ax probably every day of their life. Yeah. And so a lot of that is, is kind of, like I said, lost to history. And if we can try to, you know, salvage some of that and gather that information in certain areas so that people have access to it, then yeah. that's, I mean, information on the internet is, it's pretty crazy. Limitless. Yeah. It's pretty nuts. So the, uh, one thing, some of your videos. Yeah. I mean, like we're, we're, and we're trying to, we're trying to shift heavier into educational videos, you know, mm -hmm. things that are, you know, your sharpening video, uh, you know, you should ask your audience what, uh, what yeah. videos should you or I produce? Into, right. What information are you guys looking for? What yeah. what uh, what technique are you looking for? What is it use? Is it maintenance? Is it hanging? Is it sharpening? What what do you, what is everybody looking for? And you know, let us know so that you know either he or I can can divide yeah. and conquer and figure out how we can. Uh, exactly. Or even if it's already out there, we can just direct you to that. Yeah, that exactly. Resource. Yeah, if you're like, wow, this is Leverage a video that I work. reference all the time. Uh, yeah. You know, we have, um, I actually spoke with Dustin O'Hara of Art of Craftsmanship okay. today. Sure. Super talented artist. Uh, very passionate. Very passionate, very talented. Uh, and he runs a, a great YouTube channel. It's, um, he is someone who I respect in the way that he's like, he 
the way he talks and the way his shop is built, it's almost like he's your neighbor. Mm-hmm. He's like your talented neighbor. He's the neighbor that you would go over and be like, hey, I can't get this bolt out of this thing. And he would know how to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, I met him in Pennsylvania at the uh, Cootstown Action Junkie Extravaganza in 2019. And um, so, yeah, videos that he's put out have been just amazing as far as I watch them, I reference them. And so if you have videos similar to how his are structured, (laughs) where it's educational, and you guys reference it a lot, feel free to send them to us because I would love to share it with our customers and help those uh, YouTubers get, you know, a little bit of uh, love from us and uh, help help people learn. The the one thing going to the firewood and how that's kind of changed. I'm writing a uh, thing right now to publish for our newsletter subscribers on what, and I'm curious on your thoughts on this. What firewood and processing wood, um, like. What is the jump to how that equals freedom? Oh, so I'm, I'm a firm believer personally, and I'm trying that right now. I'm kind of in bullet points right now on, in my computer writing something for, because as we moved here to iron river, the wood is abundant. Like I can't, I don't meet when someone heard we were putting a fireplace in the house in our new place. Um, Anybody we tell is like, I've got piles of wood, just come and get it. Mm-hmm. And because they burn wood and they've got too much wood, you know? And so there's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, I know that you have heated solely off of, mm-hmm. off of firewood. Uh, um, our friend Daryl Groot, 100% off firewood uh, at that, at, I don't know if he still is, but at his old place he was. So it's like, I'm a firm believer that firewood equals freedom. Um, yeah, and I think it comes down to, um, I guess, right off the top, I had three different areas. One is uh, 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 financial control. Right. That um, in order to, to have money to invest and have money to use, you have to spend the money that you have wisely so there's, left, there's some left over. Right. Okay. Um, utilizing stuff that is free or free for the taking means that all you put in is your time and your energy. Right. And if you have more of that than you have money, that equals that equals success. Okay. Right. Um, uh, the next the next one is um, freedom of choice. That you don't have to pay what someone else tells you for a gallon of of LP. heating oil. Yeah, or LP yeah, yeah. or natural gas that somebody else isn't, isn't forcing you because in the northern states you have to heat your home. It's not an option. Yeah, it's true. You have to do it. Yeah. Otherwise, your your house is junk. Right. Exactly. You totally your house. Right. Yeah. So so that so that's another <coughs> thing is is the is that it's by choice and then uh, uh, I guess the last the last one is um, it's it's a it's a way for you to. Um, know that if if times get really tough, that you're set up to um, uh, be able to um, Stay warm. provide yeah. provide for your heating needs and yeah. your cooking needs yeah. if things get really bad. Now, yeah. granted, having access to wood is is a key to that. Yeah, and which if is you hard. don't have access, then you have to pay for it. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's also there's ways to get around all that. So right. by being smart about where you're getting your wood and how and the supply the where supply. like how much of the supply you can't be like well i'm gonna build a wood stove in my house because my neighbor has a tree he's cutting down it's like you have to have 50 neighbors with trees they're cutting down right every year right. Uh, i remember uh in the early 2000s um when wood like outdoor wood burners started becoming more efficient and more popular that everyone and brother on a farm was getting a wood wood stove yeah and they would literally burned through all the wood they had in all the field lines and they burned through all their wood in two years that they had available to them yeah and now they had to then bring in wood from someplace else or buy it and that concept at that point was like i didn't think i was going to run out of wood right of my own supply so you right. have to and that's what the back 40 comes in the back 40 on a farm normally was the 40 acres of woods that you didn't touch 
because that was your source of lumber and source of firewood and, for and the farm. And food. And food. Hunting. Hunting, Hunting right? right. Deer bed down there and create shelter for rabbits and yep. squirrels and turkeys yep. and all that. Yeah, and our, our back 40s are quickly becoming back 20s and back 10s and right. back 5s and now we're, you know, right. all these farms and especially in southern Wisconsin where we're, where we're from, where we both grew up, um, when someone refers to their back 40, it's actually re very rarely 40 acres. Right. It's usually a couple right. <laughs> or it's their neighbor's 40 that right. they have. So, um, one they're thing, always fighting over to buy once they yeah exactly they sell. yeah exactly that forty acres is going to get stripped and made into six different parcels and have houses put on it. Yeah. One thing that I um, was I was just trying to think of what my what I wanted to add into your oh another freedom is freedom of location. Sure. So you you don't have to have a natural gas line coming right through you know like where we are right now in this building this is natural gas we have to have natural gas we can't have propane we can't have we could have electric heat yeah. um we can't have wood we're in, on main street middle town there's i guarantee you there's some sort of zoning that says i can't be sticking a chimney out the top of this and dumping smoke into the parking lot across the street of the co-op um grocery store but the firewood does allow you to select where you want to live like you could Firewood is the first step into living off grid. Agreed. Like if you want, if you want to, to whether it's a choice to live off grid, it's a necessity to live off grid, or the grid goes down and you need to be able to heat your house. That's the advantage that we're piggybacking our systems here right. in, at the home that we're in. This building's screwed. The grid went down. Right. Uh, but you're not gonna live here. Yeah, I'm not living here. Uh, you know, just, it feels like it sometimes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so. It's like piggybacking your systems, that, that freedom of like being able to, you could literally live in the middle of nowhere. You could buy that plot of land that you've been wanting to buy off of somebody you saw on the internet selling it and live in, mm -hmm. in up north. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the, there's a, quite a few homes and quite a few people that I've met up here after being, coming up here regularly over the last three years that their electricity is off solar and their heat's off wood and uh, they don't ever leave the house for more than six hours. They have an online job. They have a data connection through their uh, cell tower, through their cell phone basically. Then that's how they get their job done. And so I think firewood is one of the pillars of, you know, living off grid that um, we all like to talk about, but it actually is like very important to freedom. Um, and there's only some people that are taking advantage of that. There's yeah. so many people that live in town, and even though you, you can have a, you know, a wood stove in a lot of, you know, communities, some yeah. of the larger ones don't allow it. So it's a, it's the freedom loving people yeah. that don't want to be caught in in a, the large metropolitan areas. Right. That want some space, want some fresh air. Don't mind, don't mind living, you know, down the road from a dairy farm. Yeah. Or, 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 or pig farm or whatever. Yeah, or next to a river. Yeah. Right. Uh, and, not a nice river. Right. <laughs> not a, yeah, not a fancy river. But what, no, I agree with your yeah, that, firewood is freedom. Yeah, so I've been writing my thoughts on that. I'll probably take some out of this. And if anyone else has thoughts on firewood and freedom, uh, let me know. Uh, I'd love to put it in and try to write up a little thing for you guys. But um, how many, when you heated 100% off of, uh, in the Jefferson home, uh, what... How many cords do you think you went through a year? So the worst year, and I guess I like to use that as the, you know, you know, worst case scenario type yeah. thing. You're probably not gonna get worse than that. It was, uh, that was five full months. So that it was all of November, December, January, February, and half of March. So give for almost five months. Yeah. And that's when that Arctic blast came in in 2000 and 16 i think or is it 15 i was thinking it was 14. anyways we had just gotten the cook stove in it's a large cook stove and i went through um seven cords of mixed hardwood and on a 2200 square foot house and i i did run some electric fans so even though i was the heat source is wood i still yeah. want i still Moving use electricity around. to move air around yeah 
um, cause I was using a forced air system on the house anyways. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I went through seven full cords of mixed hardwood, but I also, I also managed that fire, um, 24 seven for about three weeks when we got that Arctic blast. Yeah. Um, it, it was, it was 15 below yeah. in Southern Wisconsin for three weeks straight. Yeah. Which is pretty rare in Southern Wisconsin. I'm finding that it's not that rare up here for it to be 15 below for weeks weeks on end up here um and life doesn't really change and it's not like right. schools are getting shut down or anything like that but um i'm just i was curious about the number to apply a little bit of kind of an equation and that would be sure. how much let's just say we were, we're gonna buy split seasoned firewood seven cords hardwood or hardwood, soft? Okay. hardwood. here it's 210 dollars a cord split stacked and delivered to your house don't they don't stack it for you sure they just I said split and stack. I meant wow. split and season right. and delivered. And delivered. So 210 times seven. So 1470 a cord or uh, for the whole, season. for the whole season uh, on, on a home like yours in Southern Wisconsin. Right. I guess we're applying Northern Wisconsin wood prices to Southern Wisconsin, but there's a lot of people in this world that spend a lot more than $1,400 on propane. Oh, right. To heat up, to and, heat up four bed, uh, three bed, 2,200 square foot right. home. And that, that one season is the season when propane went up to $5 a gallon because yeah. they weren't ready for it exactly. up in the winter, up in the north. Yeah, and so we're looking at people spending three, $4,000 to keep their house yeah. from freezing out. And and their, the 1,000 gallons that they locked in on pricing went away real fast yeah, when that house is just running. Was yeah, gone. exactly. So, so we can look at that as a price and the price of propane or price of uh, natural gas. But the other thing is how much effort, because I think that the one thing that's keeping a lot of people away from switching over to wood is the amount of effort it takes. Like, yeah. well, that's a lot of work. You know, it's like, I can just, the truck shows up, plugs a hose in, fills my 500 gallon tank, to 80%, I go out and check the gauge in like a month, see it's at 50, go out and check another another month, see it's at 20, call the guy, three days later he shows up, it's just like convenience. Right. But I feel like, um, obviously everybody's different on how they're splitting firewood, mm -hmm. but a cord of firewood, to split a cord of firewood um, from rounds is, relatively easy to do in a weekend right. where you're not gonna be working on it all weekend it's just like every night you split a face cord friday you get off of work you split up 10 rounds into a and that which equals a face cord and then you just move to the next day and you split up 10 and i can i can personally split 10 rounds of firewood in in an hour sure and not really put too much effort into it i'm obviously going to be sweating when i'm done and putting in some effort so right. so if we're talking three that's that's 21 days after work so right. on a good on a good afternoon before it gets too dark yeah on a weekday um if i spend two hours if i spend two hours splitting wood by hand i create on average seven days with a firewood so between five and seven days with a firewood yeah. in two in two hours of splitting so if I have, if I need a hundred days, let's okay. say I need a hundred, hundred days of firewood yeah. divided by five, I only have to split for 20 days, for 20 which days. lines with my math of 21. So it's like, if you split for one month, if you spend one month as your workout plan, don't pay for gym membership, screw going to gym, the gym that your work provides, you know, or screw going to, you know, your CrossFit meet or whatever, just split firewood every night for 30 days you're gonna feel better that's i, I lost 20 yeah, pounds there you go you're gonna feel better your back's gonna be stronger your neck's gonna be stronger you're not gonna be as sore i mean you're gonna be sore the first your first week and the but, endorphins yeah the endorphins. and then being outside in the natural light is good for you know your mm -hmm. your mental state you know getting yeah. full spectrum light especially when it's like majority of us uh or i guess the majority of us in this building we're inside all day like right. we're fulfilling orders and we're doing manual labor, right. stacking pallets and moving stuff around. But um, the majority of our day is spent inside. Right. So getting home, splitting firewood, it's like, so the idea that firewood has allows you freedom is 
like your extra step is, is that you're getting health out of this. You're getting like mental freedom. Right. It's just like, I can't stare I can't stand staring at a computer for more than eight hours. If I have to do it back to back days, right. if I'm, if I'm staring at a computer for eight hours, if I have to do that again the next day, I am ornery. I am upset. I do not like it. And, um, if I'm splitting wood after work, it's mm-hmm. something that's going to get me out of that zone. And, and put I, me do it, go- I do it to, uh, I do it to, to finish my day and to offset my day. Because if I, like I'm on my phone on my computer all day Yeah. and I, but I also want to get out and, and use the products that we produce and get real, you know, dirt time or, or splitting time in or yeah. limbing or whatever. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm healthier, I'm more productive and I like wood heat. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So that's, uh, that's it's liberating. interesting. It's so liberating. Freedom. Yeah, freedom it's is liberating. Yeah, liberating. Yeah. Yeah. You're not tied down. It's, uh, yeah, hopefully would, would, uh, help you live a longer life. I mean, there's definitely customers of ours who are well into their late seventies, early eighties who are still splitting firewood and heating their house off of it. And, and they might not, be, you know, the crazy thing is, is you might not have to use one of these. I mean, like it's a, you can split firewood so many different ways. You know, like you can have a log splitter, like you, you can be splitting firewood. If you were like, Hey, you know, I got a bad shoulder or I'm, I just don't have the strength that I used to anymore. You can buy a log splitter that tips on its end and you just, all you have to do is just kind of kick the log, roll the log over to it and get it stood up and uh, you can get firewood. And even with the uh, hydraulic splitter, a small hatchet is good to have for you know, cutting off limbs that are in the way or even to cut the strings on something that really didn't pop off. I mean, yeah, anyone sure. who starts to split any free elm, yeah, free, there is no such a f- thing as free elm. Oh, no, it's, it's great like a free, free horse. There's no yeah. such thing as a free horse. Definitely not. There's no free elm. No. You're going to pay for it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and uh, elm is a very, very, very good uh, high BTU exactly. heat sources are so great. That's the so you're going to take it, but you're going to work it. You're going to work to get it into it's splitting. Going to warm you twice. Yeah, into <laughs> splitting, which is the, um, there's not much elm up here, if any. I don't know if there's any elm up here. There's a bunch of elm down south. Mm-hmm. That stuff that didn't get killed out by Dutch elms, but the, um, but yeah, that's the advantage of our uh, shop, the workshop at the house being heated off of uh, the wood boiler mm-hmm. is the stuff that I'm like, you know what? I am done trying to split this chunk. It gets put into a pile. It gets thrown into the wood boiler and then gets eaten up. It's yeah. I don't have to mess with it. I'm only splitting for small stuff to get the boiler started if it snuffs out, especially in the early parts of the season or the late parts of the right. season when it's warm during the day and cold at night. And it's also, um, uh, and then I'm also going to be splitting for the indoor stove. Right. I always say that it's a, uh... You get to a certain point where you start setting your ego aside and it's like you know what that round it's just going to sit there it's going to be a stump now i'm not yeah. I, I can be more productive working the other wood and splitting the other wood than killing myself for yeah. the half a day's worth of wood that's in that in that round by trying to open up a crotch or yeah right seriously so, yeah or you hit something inside of it you know that's where you not, basically right. you collect all those pieces and you give it to somebody who's got an outdoor wood burner exactly yeah and i will if anyone's in northern wisconsin uh, specifically Iron River, Wisconsin, for all you locals, <laughs> I will take any of those. So I will come and pick them up from your house if you have chunks of wood who, in which you are done trying to get firewood uh, split out of and you need to get rid of them. Just shoot me an email or right. just comment on Good this plan. video or yeah, whatever. I will, I will it's definitely, a win-win. Yeah, it's a win-win. I will take it um, and get it off your hands. So. Yeah, that's a, so yeah, I've been tossing around that in my head and uh, since I just got over this COVID thing uh, that knocked me on my ass, I have, um, ha- I spent a bunch of time writing that. That was my, okay. that was my COVID project but, but on top of our marketing plan that we we're attempting to write for, and I say attempting, I should give us more credit because we're already on top of the Black Friday, Cyber Monday, fourth quarter oh. thing uh, okay. for the first time in ever uh, this early just trying to get it worked out as perfect as we can so that when the week is there, we're ready. Um, when I was bored 
I'm thinking about that. I worked on it. I was working on this freedom thing. So yeah. Um, firewood equals freedom. I think we're going to do shirts. I think we should do shirts, stickers, um, maybe some like firewood flags, some firewood American flags or something. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Anybody who wants to help with a uh, graphic design on that, or, or at least be like, hey, you should do this, and we can hand it to our buddy Bruce who does our graphic work. That would be really cool. So um, we're going to wrap it up here in a few minutes, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk to us about anything that possibly is coming down the pipeline from Council Tool. But on, right. the, on the parameters of <laughs> don't tease anything that we don't want to hear about. Oh, sure. So it can be anything health tool related or, or kind of, uh, I'm putting a filter on you. Don't sure. tease anything that we can't offer in the next, you know, year. Oh, sure. Sure. Um, so what I do is I work on project in the background, I guess we'll call it. And, uh, we, I work with one of the engineers, actually our vice president of engineering. Uh, he and I are the ones that uh, will re We'll redesign products so that they're being improved. And uh, one of the things that we are going to be updating is our standard six pound flathead. So it's not the, the new one with the meriting slot. It's the one that is a, just our standard fire, firefighting ax, but it's going to be, it's going to balance a larger pull and uh, hopefully we'll make a good splitting ax as well. Sweet. So, um, so a big brother to this. Uh, yeah, a little bit better than that. So, but not shaped that way. It's gonna be shaped more like a fire, a flathead fire axe. Um, but like I said, we're trying to multi, do you know cover multiple markets with the same product. Yeah. And so anyone who likes a, a nice six pound axe to split with, that will be hopefully coming out uh, in the spring. What uh, do they know? What kind of steel? Uh ten sixty. Ten sixty. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it's gonna be the same as our existing six pound. It's just gonna be. Better balance, larger pull, and more void shape. Yeah, which I will preface that he's talking about the not the FE6. The FE6 no. is a 4140 steel right. axe. That one we're we'll leaving alone. Where that's exists. a new one that's we're leaving alone. Yeah. This is the one that basically is a, a lot of uh, departments will buy it to put on their trucks. Because they're not marrying with their box. Right. They don't need it to marry with the Halligan. Right. And yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Well, I'm excited to see uh, that. I've seen a couple pictures and uh, of that, but the. Um, the fire, it sounds like Council Tools really hitting uh, fire heavy with uh, yeah. fire tools, and that's that's exciting to see that we're- A lot of forcible entry, trying to really gain strides um, in forcible entry, which includes halligans, which are you know pry bars for opening doors. We call it the keys to the city. Yeah. Um, basically, you can basically you know, work your way into any any structure that way, or at least help you, help you get there. Yeah. Um, and now, obviously, the idea is to, you know, if you can gain access quicker, and safer, that means that uh, your chance of finding somebody alive is is increased. Um, so finding the source of the fire, source of the smoke, yeah. and getting it done. Saving the taking, structure. Right, saving the structure. You also save the structures next to it. Yeah. You know, well, a house fire is not just a house fire. It's a neighborhood fire. Yeah, and, maybe you let it go. Man. Right, and so by giving these guys uh, tools that way, and then we're also trying to uh, encourage uh, uh, law enforcement, um, sheriff's departments, police departments to also um, pick up our force entry uh, tools for their cruisers and their uh, patrol cars. Yeah. Because um, honestly, you know, it's you know, a police officer is usually the first person to get to a scene because he's he can get there by himself. Whereas a fire department, the truck normally doesn't leave the station unless you've got the volunteers coming in or you got everybody getting in that truck who already works full time. Yeah. So sometimes the police officer will get there first and if he can open a door and get in and gain access sooner, then that whole process is is quickened. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're encouraging, we're trying to market to the law enforcement for our flatheads and our halogens specifically okay. for that purpose, so. Yeah, cool. Yeah, we're gonna be, uh, you know, you guys are gonna be seeing a lot more fire stuff coming from Whiskey River over the next, uh, three to six months starting, uh, getting some wildland stuff going, getting yeah. some... Yeah, we're in the middle, uh, wildland firefighting is, is at the peak right now. Yeah, it's it's hot and heavy on the wildfires. So wildland, uh, municipal. municipal, and then also marketing that to homeowners, people who wanna, again, kind of like that freedom is you're in the middle of nowhere and you wanna get ahead of a fire, say you've got a grass fire, and we, we're gonna be starting to carry some fire rakes and some swatters and 
And just for landscaping as well. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the idea that a professional tool used to save home, life, and community can also do exactly the same jobs or other jobs like landscaping, raking, moving leaves. I mean, I have a, I have a four time fire rake that I don't understand how I live without it for yeah. removing wild raspberries. Yeah, that's true. Seriously, yeah. a wild raspberry bush is huge and you sharpen those teeth on that thing, you, it acts like a sickle. Yeah. Cut it right at the ground and then grab at the same time. It's a one tool thing. And so if it's good at moving fuel for a brush fire, it's then it's good, good for- Good for brush in the backyard. Exactly. Yeah, so you'll be guys, you guys will be seeing more of that coming from council. They offer a decent amount of firefighting tools and are working very hard to expand that line and kind of like work with the uh, departments and such to offer them what they what they need, what they want, what would make their job easier. So stay tuned for that. Um, any uh, anything else? Anything? Any closing uh, thing? Um, We're probably not gonna be able to what, do this for right. another while. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, I'd, I'd say I don't really have anything new coming. I mean, I got a lot of ideas. Um, we're so, we're, the demand for our product is so high that it's hard for us to insert new products when we have, you know, such a backlog on the ones we already have. Right. And that's, that's a kind of a good problem to have, but the emphasis is on that is problem. It's still a problem yeah. because it's hard for us to expand and develop and, and meet, you know, um, industry desires. Yeah. And which basically lead to demands, which then lead to sales, right? Yeah. So it's it's hard so to key, right. stay ahead of that. Yeah. Um, which is what we're facing with our axe handles. You know, it's like it's like we want to expand the line, but if we expand the line into more, you know, as we expand the heritage line more and more, we got this twenty eight C that's coming out before the end of the year. Uh, don't email me ask me when, <laughs> but you guys will hear hear about it when it does come out. Uh, like that twenty eight C, it's going to take away. It's going to take away from another handle. You know, sure. it's like there's only so much premium lumber we have access to. There's only so many man hours. There's only so much marketing dollars it takes to to offer these things and sell these to people. Right. So it's like we're just, we're capped until we can figure out um, which we're actively working on through different avenues to improve. But right. I feel like every retailer slash manufacturer right now in America is feeling the, the constraints of... Uh, are the demand being up and the supply being down and um that's just how it is you know right. and it's a perfect storm yeah it's a perfect storm and we all saw it coming in uh 2020 i mean early 2020 when we start stuff started getting shut down i was like this is going to be a disaster people are going to be sitting at home right. i think that what everybody got wrong was the de is not understanding how much the demand would increase at the same time yeah. Knowing that the logistics thing was going to be a nightmare right. and, you know, nobody working and which means the supply chains are messed up. But then with nobody working, they're sitting at home buying stuff, they're yeah. sitting at home buying stuff, right? Yeah. Or they're working remotely, but they're yeah. building a deck in their backyard or yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever they're doing. Yeah. So the demand for, sure. for hand tools has just been, yeah, it's been surreal. Or they're just laid off. Right. There's like so many people that were laid off that were just like, well, what's social distancing? It's like, well, I'm just going to go in the woods. I'm going to right. go on Google. I'm going to type in top 10 tools I need to go in the woods. Mm -hmm. Never been in the woods in my life. And a hatch is one of them. Right. An axe is one of them. And uh, the outdoor market exploded. Yeah, it did. And I'm, I'm super grateful for it because it got a lot of really, uh, it got a lot of new people out into the woods to experience like what that is. Right. And then, and they're still doing it. We have so many customers that are, are woods newbies, but now they're two years in. And they've spent more time in the woods in the last two years than I have because I've been in this right. building or I've been in the old warehouse. You know, it's right. like so they're they've experienced the woods in the last two years way more than the majority of of people. Uh, they're catching, they're making up for lost time. Yeah, exactly. I'm super happy about that. I, it, it makes me it makes me happy that people are able to get out and use these tools and and just be out in the woods and right. just enjoy it, even if they're not using our tools. It's just right. nice to see people out there. So yeah. Um, well, um, yeah, I, I guess the last, uh, last thought is, uh, uh, as a representative council tool, I want to extend, um, our appreciation to everybody out there. Um, the end users, uh, the dealers, uh, such as yourself who are all struggling with the, the same 
logistics and backlogs. Yeah. Um, and just so everyone knows that we are making strides to, to get past that and yeah. to get quality products out there and to, to not just sit back and say, hey, we're American made, but yeah. we, want, we want people to be proud of our, proud of our American made. And yeah. proud to support American companies. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, I thank agree. Thank everybody yeah. for that. Yeah. Thanks for supporting Council. Thanks for supporting us. Thanks for supporting all the other companies that are American made, yeah. uh, based and American uh, owned. Uh, it's way more helpful than uh, I think most think. I've been able to offer jobs to people here in right. in rural northern Wisconsin that that normally wouldn't be able to get a job here. Uh, that pays what we pay and. Um, that is what American Made represents. So mm -hmm. it's pretty cool. Yeah. So hey. thanks for coming. Thanks for talking. And uh, until next time, guys. Take care, guys. Be good.